So talking about talking about um, gender as one of those as one of those elements that we are uh, socialized into, and one of the elements that describes our intersectionality is gender, right? So here's my cartoon for the week, and uh, I love this cartoon. So basically. Um, what we're looking at in, in in socialization, whether to be socialized as a woman or a man, to be socialized as a black woman or a black man, whether to be socialized as Latinx, all of these social identities, also to be socialized as a member of the upper class or the lower class, we're all socialized into these social identities. So what I'm going to talk about today is gender socialization, but you can take any social identity and apply what we're learning about socialization to that social identity. So if you are of an upper class or a lower class, those things that we're gonna learn about in terms of socialization apply to class socialization. It applies to racial socialization. It applies to um, ability socialization. It applies to anything. Um, so this is a, a, little, a little picture about, about gender socialization. So what is gender socialization? So gender socialization is a process where humans in the course of social interactions, as well as exposure and reactions to diverse information are molded and continually shaped to cultural appropriateness of femaleness and maleness. So one of the things that I think of when I think about this is that this is really a social interactionist or um, symbolic interactionist perspective, right? So we're looking at how social interactions shape our social identities. So for example, I know last week or the week before I gave an example, if I listen to stupid music or wear a stupid shirt, my friends are gonna say, oh, Kate, you look so dumb. Listen to that bad music from the seventies or whatever, turn that, turn that off. Um, so that's a micro interaction that it serves to make me conform to deviance, right? That we explored last week. Um, but also these social interactions shape how I am as a as a woman or in the class that I'm in or in the race that I'm in, it shapes those things, right? So if I, um, I don't know, if I start listening to um, some sort of music that is associated with men, I don't know what that would be. Or if I wear something, what's the better example would be if I'm wearing manly clothes. My or or when I used to have really short haircuts, you should, people would say to me, "You look like a man. Get, grow your hair out. You look like a man. Are you a woman or a man? Grow your hair out. Wear more feminine clothes. You look like such a man." So these kinds of social interactions are shaping my gender socialization, right? I say, I say, "Oh, they just gave me some indirect feedback that I'm not conforming to my gender role. Therefore, I should adopt the way that I do my hair or adopt the way I dress." to conform more to my gender role. So these micro interactions start in, at infancy, but they continue all throughout your life to shape you. And it really go back to our lessons of last week about how informal control of deviance, this is really adding on to that about how deviance is, um, is controlled by micro interactions. So gender is really at the basis of everything. So everything starts at gender socialization because all of our other norms and behaviors, whether it's religious socialization, school socialization, um, political socialization, economic socialization, all of that begins with gender. Gender is the very bottom of all of these other kinds of socialization. So if you think about, for example, uh, being whatever race you are, if you're if you're white, if you're African American, if you're black, if you're Latinx, whatever, um, we always uh, preface that with she's a white woman, she's a black woman, she's a, a Latinx or a Hispanic woman, right? We always preface whatever gen whatever race you are, whatever uh, class you are with, with your gender. Your gender is ultimately the most important socialized concept. So we learn societal norms from birth and throughout life. We're not just learning them from our parents, we're learning them throughout life. And we understand their value and relevance as part of society, and we accept them as our own. This is called socialization. So socialization is a process through which we learn the social norms and social values of society, and we internalize them. 
Um, so when we are learning and internalizing the rules and norms, when shared beliefs about what girls and women do or what boys and men should do, this is gender socialization. So we think of gender socialization in terms of what we should do as far as like what jobs are proper for men and women, uh, the emotional expression of what men and women should do. You know, men should uh, men should be strong and they shouldn't cry and they shouldn't show their emotions and women should uh, be emotional and they should cry and they should tell people when they don't feel well. All of these things are part of gender socialization. And of course, just like we've learned about, about norms, social norms, is that gender norms are widely variant across cultures. So I would love to hear more from Claire and others of you that have lived in different cultures, including Ben, to hear how gender norms are different across different cultures. So American women and American men are very different from French men and French women who are very different from uh, men and women from Morocco who are very different from men and women in Japan. So these are really culturally specific and they're also time specific. So men, and, American men and women today are really different from men and women in the seventies, not to mention men and women uh, in the 1800s. So we've talked already about how social norms vary across time and place, so do gender norms. Um, <clears throat> So as we're learning these gender norms, we also learn and understand the consequences of not conforming to these gender norms. So if we, if I wear short hair or wear masculine clothing, I've learned that I may get um, teased for it. I may get, in, you know, informal punishment for it. But even worse, if I decide to... Um, Let's say, for example, if I decide to become a construction worker, I may be sexually harassed. I may be um, catcalled. I may be actually physically hurt by, by breaking gender norms and doing something that's not considered appropriate for a woman. Um, so by internalizing these social norms, we also internalize unequal social norms. So as a woman, I learn as a child that I'm not as valued as men. In this society, in this time, I learned that I'm not as valued as men. I learned that my place is in the home. I learned that my place is to raise children. I learned that my place is to, to um, take care of my husband and take care of my children well. Um, now, this is changing in the U.S., right? So when I was raised in the 70s, those were the norms that I learned because women were just going back into the workforce. My mother didn't work until I was like 10 years old. She raised us um, in person until I was 10 years old. That was still pretty normal in the 70s. Um, so I was raised with different gender roles and people who are being raised today. Um, but I also learned, I learned in the 70s that men and women are unequal. I learned that my place was to be um, the emotional caretaker of the family. I learned that my place was to take care of my husband and take care of my children um, exclusively. Like, for example, my dad wasn't allowed in the um, birthing room when I was born because men weren't considered to be part of the um, family in the same way that women were. My mom's mom was there when I was born, but my father was not. So that really shows how, how men and women in the 70s really were treated unequally and how their role in parenting was considered to be different um, than it is now. So gender socialization is a complex process that continues at birth. It intensifies in, in adolescence, but it really, um, it really continues throughout life. And like I said, I am continually being reminded what a proper man or what a proper woman should do. And if I break those norms, then I am deviating from the social norms of the gender in which I was socialized in. Therefore, I um, get informally or even formally punished. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out here is that your gender identity is um, socialized with you beginning at birth, so the, or even before birth, right? So, so in the United States, we um, usually know the sex of the baby before they're born, and we start buying appropriate clothing, buying appropriate toys, 
people ask you when you're pregnant, oh, are you pregnant with a boy or girl? What are you going to have? And then you pick boy or girl names and um, you start thinking of the baby in terms of a boy or a girl before they're even born. So you've already begun socializing, you're socializing yourself to react to that boy or a girl before they're born. You start thinking of them as a boy or a girl before they're even born. And then the minute they're born, you start identifying, this is my baby boy, this is my baby girl. And, you know, maybe you're not buying pink or red, blue clothing for your, for your baby, but your friends are definitely doing that. Your family is definitely doing that. And like I said, Sean, in that cartoon earlier, the first thing someone asks when you see that baby in the carriage is, is it a boy or a girl? And in that cartoon, the person said, I don't know, it hasn't told me yet. Um, so that really talks about another objective, which shows how people, not everybody, has to conform to the is it a boy or a girl dichotomy. Um, and now in, in the United States, we've moved away or we're starting to move away by from the um, strict rules of having to be a boy or girl, we're having a lot more flexibility and people are learning a lot more um, that the gender binary does not have to be the gender binary. They have a lot more um, ability to say, I am not a boy or a girl, I'm something else. Um, and so we're getting a lot more flexibility with that, but we're definitely not all the way there in terms of accepting that we don't have a gender binary system. Um, so what I want to talk about here is this middle box is internalizing gender norms. Is it harmful? Um, so when you think about internalizing these gender norms, some of them are not, harm some of them are not harmful, right? Um, but in general, let's say a boy is internal, is, is socialized to not, to not show his feelings, um, to not cry, to not get emotional. So one of the things we found is that when men do not show their feelings, if a boy is, is, is socialized to not show his feelings, one of the things that happens in relationships is that because he's bottling everything up, he gets really angry and may lash out physically or may lash out emotionally or mentally um, and become abusive because he hasn't been expressing his feelings. Uh, another great example from the United States is that men aren't socialized to seek medical help um, because they're supposed to be tough and they're supposed to be, um, you know, resistant to pain. And so there's there's facts that show that men don't seek medical help nearly as fast as women do. Um, they suffer through lots of illnesses and lots of injuries without seeking medical help, thereby making it when they finally do seek medical help, they're much more sick and much more likely to die as a result of not seeking medical help than women. That's one of the reasons why men die earlier than women because they're not seeking medical help. For example, my father-in-law went two and a half weeks without urinating and, um, yeah, um, and he had a severe bladder condition and he didn't urinate for two and a half weeks and he ultimately died as a result. And um, it's because his bladder burst and whereas a woman, she's a urinate in a day, she's going to the emergency room. Um, and, and men don't do that. Uh, some men, some men, especially at his age, right? He was in his eighties. So when he was socialized, he was socialized really strongly to be strong and to not, um, not to not seek help. Um, and women, of course, in the United States, maybe, um, gender socialized to, um, to, for example, to not express when they're angry. So we're, we're taught to um, suppress our emotions and to suppress our anger. And again, it builds up and you may find women who turn to alcohol or drugs, for example, because they haven't been taught that it's okay to express our anger. So gender stereotypes are oversimplified and overgeneralized beliefs of what, men, when, what women and men are like and what values and traits are expected of us. So again, how do we expect men and women to act? So these gender stereotypes are all around us and um, they embed in everything surrounding us. So again, we breathe gender stereotypes. Gender stereotypes underlie every other stereotype. Every other social norm is underlined by gender. <clears throat> gender is 
the most important thing that we look about look at when we look at your um your social identity um so part of this social uh gender norms are part of our institutions and practices and they're normalized which means we don't even think twice about them so one of my favorite examples is that people say to me <clears throat> women are just more nurturing than men women are be supposed to be the caretakers of the family because women are just naturally more nurturing than men and that is not true women are not biologically more nurturing than men um period and we have proof of this from other countries and other eras that show for example in the middle ages rich women used to have babies and then turn them over to their their um, nursemaids to raise them to breastfeed them, raise them, because they didn't want to have anything to do with their children. They didn't want to have anything to do with nursing or caring for their children, so they pass them on to another woman to take care of them. Um, <clears throat> so women are not naturally born or, or um, genetically born to be more nurturing than men. They are socialized in this culture, they are socialized to be more nurturing than men, but they are not biologically, genetically more um, nurturing than men. So some of the agents of social gen of gender socialization are parents, we've talked about that, but teachers and peers, we've talked about that, immediate commu and community, all of these forces together tell us what is a proper man and woman supposed to do. So I talked about how my peers may informally sanction me for not looking like a woman or dressing like a woman, but I also hear in my in the media that I consume in the community that I'm in, what is the proper way to act as a man or a woman? And my last slide is is the other other agents of socialization. So religion, government, media, work, ethnic background, clubs and social groups, and school, all of these things influence how we behave as a man or a woman. And it's important to remember that all of these things change over time and across cultures. So that's all I have.